The New America Foundation Forum on Drones continues with a discussion about how drones are being adapted for non-military purposes, including law enforcement and border patrols, and by civilians for journalism and agriculture. We're now going to segue into a short uh, presentation that's going to capture some of what uh, a number of us have mentioned earlier, which is the interplay between the development of technologies uh, at a, at a, in a time of war on the battlefield and how they, they're, they're brought back. Um, and in some cases, maybe not. I think there are also lots of examples of technologies uh, deployed in war where people imagine that people imagine will have widespread commercial domestic use and then uh, there are some surprises uh, either way there. Um, it's, this is also an opportunity for me to uh, embarrass Tori Bosch, uh, who is our great editor at Slate, and she's sitting in the back. Um, hi, Tori. Yes. So in addition to events, uh, as most of you uh, might know, uh, Future Tense has a dedicated section channel, as they're called online, on the Slate.com website. And Tori uh, blogs and manages um, that site and, and assigns and edits a lot of great articles uh, often pegged to these events, but also separate from the events. And I mentioned that at this point because our next presenter, Constantine Kakaeus, who is a uh, Schwartz Fellow here at the New America Foundation, writes a, a lot on technology in a, in a number of uh, guises, uh, including uh, frequently for Tory on the Future Tense channel. And if you go now to Slate, you will see an article that's related to what he will be presenting on today, which is bringing the war home. Go there. Thank you, Andres. Uh, I wanted to echo Andres's thanks uh, to, to Tori, uh, as well as to Adam Sneed, uh, who is uh, running around here in a blue shirt and has been integral uh, both to this presentation and to the whole day, I think. Um, if I can figure out how to advance the slides. Um, there we go, forward and back. Um, so this may, may seem like s something of an odd quote to many of you. Uh, it's the second half of a uh, quote that's better known to the extent that it's become a, a cliche, beating swords into plowshares. The second part of that, which is from the Bible, from Isaiah 2.4, is says that they shall turn their spears into pruning hooks. You don't hear that as often. The question is, when are things actually useful? And uh, part of what I wanted to do is we have a lot of discussion here. You have Michael Toscano telling you that drones can cure world hunger, that there's this enormous pent-up promise in them. Uh, you have uh, Professor Missy Cummings telling you that drones are safer and more cost effective than, than manned aircraft. Uh, part of what I'm here to say is, when is that actually true? Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Uh, the drones, the, if you take the Predator, Reaper, and Global Hawk together, they crash three times more often than the fleet average for uh, aircraft in, in the U.S. Air Force. So the, how, how can someone say they're safer when also they crash? three times as much. Now that may change in the future, but at the present, they're much less capable than they might seem to be. Part of the way uh, I want to understand this is to think a little bit about the historical context that we're in. We're in a moment where drones have been incredibly useful on the battlefield in the last decade, and they're now coming back. I wanted to try and think about some examples in the past that, that we might sort of reason by analogy to. This, uh, you can't really see it very well, but there's a little nuclear uh, symbol up there. This is an NB-36. Uh, it was meant to be an atomic-powered airplane. Now, this might sound like a very silly idea to, to everybody today. Between 1946 and 1961, the Air Force and the Atomic Energy Commission spent about $7 billion trying to make a nuclear-powered airplane. This airplane flew 47 times, carrying a three-megawatt reactor. The reactor didn't actually power the airplane because it was experimental. So it had regular engines, but was flying around with a nuclear reactor. And this seemed, you can go back and read all kinds of ideas of nuclear power, it's better than previous things, it's cleaner, it lasts forever, we'll throw our airplanes on nuclear power. Didn't happen. It was actually technically quite difficult. This is a familiar looking mushroom crowd, cloud. This is from part of Project Plowshare, which was a, again a long effort. There were 35 nuclear detonations between 1958 and 1975. Project Plowshare was a project to look at peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Uh, part of it was Project Chariot. You were going to use atomic explosions to create artificial harbors. There was Project Ditch Digger to build new canals, both in Panama and in Nicaragua. In fact, when they were building Interstate 40 in California, 
there was a feasibility study conducted with the California Department of Transportation to use nuclear weapons to uh, cut a new line through the mountains uh, east of Ludlow, California uh, to, to build a new interstate. Uh, there was also a sort of a precursor to what we know as fracking today, uh, a number of nuclear tests done together with the natural gas industry in which you would explode a nuclear weapon underground uh, in order to free up natural gas. This may all seem sort of neither here nor there in a discussion about drones, but the point I want to make is that nuclear weapons were tremendously useful in war. Uh, there was a large group of people who said, okay, these things are great, therefore let's use them for peace. They turned out not to be very good. Um, Time Magazine, uh, January 1964. Uh, this is uh, the, the canal example that I was giving you. And there were many, now sort of looking back, this seems like a ludicrous idea. At the time, there were many smart people who thought this. These sort of trying to look at the engineering trade-offs, the economic cost-benefit analyses are not easy things to do. We can look back in retrospect. Uh, one of the main sort of people behind the beginning of the nuclear-powered aircraft was Enrico Fermi, one of the most prominent physicists of the 20th century. He's not, it's easy to, to misapprehend how good things are. Supersonic travel is another thing. JFK addressing the graduating class of the Air Force Academy on J June 5th, 1963. Uh, at the time, Lyndon Johnson had just concluded a study uh, of the economic feasibility of, uh, the economic and technical feasibility of an American commercial supersonic aircraft. Those are JFK's words. Uh, JFK said, Johnson looked at this, his technical people, they think it's great. It is my judgment that this government should immediately commence a new program in partnership with private industry to develop at the earliest practical date the prototype of a commercially successful supersonic transport, superior to that being built in any other country in the world. Of course, it didn't happen. There was a lot of discussion at the time of America will lose its competitive edge if we don't do this, etc. We didn't do it. The sky didn't fall in. There was a race. This was in 1963 that he gave this speech. Uh, the British and French did it. They built the Concorde. They built 20 of them. It was essentially a failure. It didn't, the, the market wasn't there. It was too expensive. Of course, I'm cherry picking examples here where there were military technologies that proved to be too expensive or you know, created too much radiation were for some reason or another impractical in a civilian sphere. Here's another example. That's a GPS satellite. Uh, GPS had been in the works for a long time. Uh, it was sort of gathering steam in the early 80s. In 1983, Korean Airlines Flight 007 was shot down uh, by the Russians after straying off course. Uh, Ronald Reagan said he would open up GPS to civilian use. Uh, a lot of the original discussion was, was still quite muted. There wasn't an immediate sense that GPS would become nearly as prevalent as it has. Uh, a receiver cost $20,000 even in 1988. So they were talking about putting GPS on commercial aircraft. Chrysler was starting to talk about putting them on cars. But GPS is, is an example contrary to the ones I just gave you of a military technology that became very, very widespread. Why did it do this? It got a lot cheaper and it did something that there was no other good way of doing it. Now the question is, are drones somehow analogous to GPS in that they can be a lot cheaper than the alternative and do something that there's no alternatives? Or are they like some of these other examples uh, where there's something that was very useful in wartime, not as useful um, in peace. Uh, part of the question you want to ask is how difficult things are technically to do. I wanted to go back to Rose's example this morning of can an enterprising person get a gun and tie it on their UAV that they bought for $400 and then have a weaponized drone? And the answer is basically, Rosa said, oh, I can't do this, but maybe someone who's better. It's really hard to do that. Raytheon can do it. Um, it's not something that a hobbyist can easily do in a way that would be remotely effective. It turns out you need to aim the thing, you need to control it. This is not simple to do. Here's an example that I think is, is a reasonable sort of historical analogy to the drone. That's uh, Sikorsky, who uh, made the father of the helicopter, not the inventor per se. Uh, this is Life magazine from 1943. Uh, you had in this time in the Second World War, uh, helicopters were first rising to prominence. They'd been around for a long time, but they were now starting to be mass produced. Uh, Samuel Solomon, the president of Northeast Airlines in 1943, prophesied that there would be air taxi services. You'd have a helicopter, it would pick you up in your office in Boston, take you to your office in New York. Now, 
this sort of exists in a very limited sense for the very, very rich. But he thought the mail would be delivered by helicopters. There'd be networks of hundreds of helicopter taxi stations. And helicopters would be like taxis. They aren't because it's very expensive to do so, not because we couldn't do it in principle. You had a helicopter, taxi, so all this sort of idea. Um, go back. Coming back to drones, the question that I want to ask is essentially an economic one. And as I was saying, these are difficult questions to get right. But I think our intuitions, collectively, have been skewed uh, because of the utility of drones at war. Uh, I want to take a specific example, the K-Max, which Professor Cummings mentioned, uh, which is an unmanned cargo helicopter which delivers cargo to remote bases in Afghanistan. If you're flying into the mountains of Afghanistan, there's lots of reasons you might not want to have a pilot. That's a lot less true if you're flying cargo from Memphis to, to O'Hare. Uh, the benefits you get from not having a pilot in a war zone, many of those benefits are conspicuously absent uh, over American airspace. Um, taking another example of the economics of drones at present, and this may change over the time scale of decades, but for the foreseeable future, if you don't have an autonomous drone, you still have a human in the system. You're still paying that human, regardless of whether the human's on the ground or in the airplane. Uh, today, a, uh, a drone like a, a Predator costs about $5 million, of which about a million is the sensor package. About $4 million is just the airframe itself. A Cessna, which you could get used for $100,000 or you know, new for $250,000, can carry the same amount as that Predator can for, you know, roughly speaking, a tenth of the cost. Now, the Cessna can maybe fly for eight hours instead of 24 hours. Um, so there's trade-offs there. If you're flying over rural Yemen, you might not be able to fly your Cessna because you're based at a remote place. You need that long loiter time. There's plenty of good reasons why the Air Force and the intelligence community have used drones where they have. Those reasons don't apply over the US. And you'll say, yes, I can go out and get a drone for $300. But the cheap drones are not that capable, and the capable ones are not that cheap. Um, these uh, smaller drones. Um, Take the Dragon Flyer, for instance, which you know, law enforcement has bought. The Seattle Police Department bought them and then returned them after public outcry. It can loiter for 20 minutes. That gives it a niche capability. It doesn't make it useless, but it doesn't make it capable of flying overhead for as long as, say, a Cessna can. Um, there's a Cessna. Moving on. Part of sort of how we think about sort of what drones are capable of, a uh, so few people already today referenced this example of drones delivering beer. Um, this is essentially a fake news story. The events at Debix take place in August of 2013. It hasn't happened yet. It might not happen. If it does happen, it's a gimmick. It's attracting publicity. We're talking about it for this South African beer company. It doesn't mean the drones are actually going to be economically doing this all over the place. And explicitly in this popular science story about it, it says it offers a good idea of what commercial drones will look like in action. And I would say that that's wrong. It offers a bad idea. It attracts attention. It hasn't happened. It might not even work in August. It certainly won't work on a large scale. The same way that Shane was asking earlier if uh, drones will replace bicycle messengers. Turns out there's you know, a lot of sort of hipster dudes who like to fix gear bikes who will do things for pretty cheap. And can you do that cheaper than them with a sophisticated drone that might have to get recharged every 20 minutes? Not anytime soon. Uh, I wanted to look quickly at a, at a real news story. This is from last week's New Yorker. It's about a fancy new LIDAR sensor uh, detecting, do, making archaeological discoveries in the rainforest. Uh, the sensor costs about a million dollars. It's the state of the art. They had to get special export permission to fly it over Honduras. And the sensor was flown on an aged Cessna 337 Skymaster with a third of its paint, a streak of oil down the fu fuselage. You can put new sophisticated sensors on very old airframes and have them work very well for a lot cheaper sometimes than drones with equal capability. And uh, it's something to think about in terms of when we think about how quickly will dr drones be adapted, how good will they be. It's going to take time because they not only have to be able to do something, they have to be able to do it cheaper than the alternatives can. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Constantine. Just when the exuberance was getting us to order lunch via drones, you, you brought us back down to reality, and it's always good to have uh, skepticism and, and to offer some of those cautionary tales. It was a really interesting presentation. Um, and now we're going to turn back to Shane. We're, we're making you work hard today, Shane. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we're going to have a conversation that's going to broaden the scope of the kinds of uh, applications and uh, contexts that we've been talking about in terms of balancing security and privacy and, once again, looking at the state of technology. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, Andres. Um, so now we're getting down into the level of individuals with drones and smaller groups of people with drones, and we have a great panel. Um, let me just introduce everyone here, uh, and then uh, to my right, first we have um, Joseph Hall, who is the Senior Staff Technologist at the Center for Democracy and Technology, and he writes frequently about security and surveillance and, and, and a lot of these issues. Uh, Matthew Waite, who's a journalism professor at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, who founded the Drone, Drone Journalism Lab. Uh, to help students and faculty explore how drones are used in reporting. Uh, and Captain Don Roby from the Baltimore County Police Department, who is a training program manager uh, at the Airborne Law, Enf Airborne Law Enforcement Association. Um, a, a quick personal story on this. I am not myself a drone flyer, but um, I had a, a fun sort of encounter with this and the, and, the, and the unique problems that maybe we encounter with trying to fly drones for recreational use in D.C. Uh, but some friends of mine who run a very good blog called Lawfare um, got it in their heads uh, last year that they wanted to have a drone smackdown competition. And the idea was that they were each going to build using a parrot drone that they were allowed to mod. It's a parrot drone. It's going to be small four-rotor things that you can get at Brookstone or on Amazon for a few hundred bucks. Um, you could modify it to within a few hundred dollars, and essentially they were going to try and weaponize it. No ballistics, so it couldn't shoot anything. You know, people were putting like chain mail and dental floss hanging down to go into the rotors and like sticks on the outside and stuff. And we got this bright idea that we were going to go do this in Fort Reno Park and I was going to be the referee. And Fort Reno Park is, you know, up in northwestern Washington. And they were advertising this on the blog to sort of get the readers excited about it. And we got what effectively I think could count as a cease and desist order from the FAA Whoa. saying don't try it. Um, there had been an issue with another D.C. resident a couple weeks before who had flown a drone, I think, over in Adams Morgan, and he maybe had lost track of it, and he got a note about that. So it was a very interesting sort of encounter. And what we realized that basically is that these things that I think could rightly be called hobby aircraft were being told you can't fly them in D.C. because of the air restriction around Reagan National and the mall and all the rest of it. So as the FAA looked at this parrot drone with dental floss on it as basically a flight risk. So we had to go out to Manassas and do it anyway. And NPR covered it, and it was really fun. So you can go listen to that sometime. But it was sort of an interesting introduction to like what happens when individuals get hold of this stuff and all of these sort of uh, potentially really fun and interesting uses, and then the way that can sort of collide with policy and regulation and law on a very personal level. So we're going to get into a lot of this kind of stuff. And what I want to do is actually just to start with something very specific. Um, Don, I want to ask you, I mean, you come from you're the law enforcement side. We've been talking a lot about the public safety applications of this technology. Just give us a sense of how Baltimore County Police Department is using this stuff right now and how your colleagues in law enforcement are using it or want to. Well, we don't use it in Baltimore County. We're a very traditional aviation unit with three uh, large hel helicopters. Um, what law enforcement is using this for, um, or they want to use it for, is for search and rescue. We want to use it for crime scene photographing, you know, and there could be protected areas on that too would require a search and seizure warrant for uh, traffic accidents, um, things of that nature. We also, a lot of our aircraft and law enforcement gets used for other governmental uh, uses. We assist the fire departments. We also do work with uh, our environmental protection people for, you know, runoffs and things like that. So that's what you're seeing. Uh, you also will see it for like tactical operations in which they would come up and they would, um, uh, just check the rear of a yard to make sure there's no suspect in there. Then move a SWAT team in or a tactical team into that area to secure it. And that's really what they're using it for. Nothing about persistent surveillance. I haven't heard any talk about persistent surveillance in our circles. Everything's been operationally necessary. And a real quick up flight, check something out, bring it back down. I mean, you can imagine if you have a missing child in a wooded area, a small confined area, how easy it would be to take one of these devices out of the trunk of a car, launch it, check that small area, then move on and start checking other areas. And that's what we're seeing, very operationally, uh, you know, situations like that. And that's where we're going with it. 
Uh, and is it, is it expensive? It is a large part of the budget to do that, or is it you realize tremendous savings by? Very, a lot of savings. Most of our uh, uh, helicopters, like we would operate in my, where I work, are very expensive per hour to operate. And if you start talking about an uh, unmanned aircraft system, a UAS, small UAS, you're talking pennies on the dollar to operate it for just a few minutes. You could clear it in an area very quickly. And so, so, Matt, you run a, a, journal, a drone journalism lab. Tell us about that and then what you're seeing as the potential use um, for, for people like me, like you, who do reporting. I mean, what, where, where is the technology going to take us? Uh, weirdly, the answers are, are a lot the same. It's uh, the, the kind of uses that I see are um, short, go up in the air, get us perspective on something, come back down. Um, maybe fly around an area, maybe not. It really depends on the kind of skill of the operator. Um, things like natural disasters, things, uh, environmental change, uh, growth and development, anything with like a large spatial extent uh, is where, where uh, my mind has gone uh, on a lot of this. And the, uh, the economic argument actually is the, the, the winning argument here for, for journalism is that those TV news helicopters are multi-million dollar aircraft and they cost many hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to maintain and fuel and hire a pilot and all things like that. When you're talking about something you can buy for less than a thousand dollars and do just about what you need it to do, um, it's a really, really powerful argument. Uh, it opens up gigantic questions, um, but I think the, the kind of basic use for photo and video is, is, is pretty obvious. It doesn't involve a lot of imagination. And are there journalist organizations doing that now? Are there TV stations that have them or newspapers? No, um, because the FAA has said, nah. So um, we have a kind of a limited window that we can, we can experiment with uh, as a university. But uh, I get calls pretty much weekly from um, general managers at news, uh, at television news organizations, editors at newspapers, website operators, people like that saying, okay, I've got my credit card out. I want to buy. What do I get? And I'm like, hold on. Let's, let's talk for a moment. Uh, I, I often tell people that I feel like the dream crusher. Um, I said, you know, just hold your credit card for just a few more years and, and we'll, we'll be able to talk. Is, is, when you say the FAA says, says no to it, I mean, is it, is it no in the way that they said no to me and my buddies flying in Fort Reno Park, or it's, is it? It's the commercial restriction. Okay. Because um, if it's a for-profit making journalism. Exactly. Yep. They, they consider journalism to be a commercial purpose. End of story. Um, I, I've said all along that if, if that were to go away, but all the other restrictions would be in place. Have to stay under 400 feet, have to be away from people, have to be far away from an airport, um, can't fly over built up areas, you know, people's heads, anything like that. We'd be in the business. Right. I mean, there's stories to be done out in the wide open spaces. Um, but that commercial restriction just, that, that pretty much ends it. Okay. So, Joe, you're coming at this, you know, you write about this, you're coming at it from a policy perspective, you're thinking about the social implications. I mean, one question I want to ask you is, Real, I asked this with, with Missy and with Michael. Realistically, how long do you think it is, in your mind's eye, before the technology is, let's assume it's available legally, and that it's cheap enough for people to get it. How long until sort of everyone has a drone? I mean, I'm not saying it's ubiquitous as having a cell phone, but where you or I could go get them, and it's not a novelty anymore. Well, I, I think that's right now. I mean, you can get pretty capable um, drone platforms uh, with various kinds of sensor packages right now. Um, the trick is is that, you know, I think what you're seeing in terms of sort of the public reaction and sort of a visceral, react, visceral reaction is that, you know, we want to integrate these things not only into our airspace but into sort of the fabric of our society and do so in a responsible way. Uh, in my PhD, I hacked voting machines and one of the things we learned there was that we had introduced, you know, networked and computerized voting machines just instantaneously after the 2000 election, we hadn't taken the time to figure out, hey, these things are actually pretty bad. Um, and and I think, you know, we, we I see similar things here in the sense that we want to make sure this is done responsibly. I don't think, you know, there, there are some voices that say no drones at all, and there's some voices that say no regulation at all, and I think it's, it's somewhere in the middle. I don't know where it is, you know, but when you start having these things co-occupy manned space, manned airspace, um, and when you start having things like the thing that I always think about, the thing that's sort of my litmus test, and I still don't have a good answer for this, is what if, you know, a major corporation starts flying um, automated license plate reader drones and has sort of like a 
a search engine where you can put people's license plates in and see everywhere where they're driven. I think that sort of brings a lot of things together in that sort of thought experiment in the sense that not a lot of people would enjoy that existing. Um, there's not a lot that regulation can do to stop that kind of a thing. Um, but it's the kind of thing that is, it will happen eventually. And is it worth sort of the chill on our ability to freely assemble or to speak um, and, and, you know, another sort of privacy-related interest to, to, to do that? Or should we have a more sort of normative discussion? And, you know, people like the, the, the AUVSI and the, um, as, as um, Don had mentioned in, a, in an email, the International Association of Chiefs of Police have sort of these codes of conduct for doing these kinds of things responsibly. But from a lot of other industry areas, I've seen codes sort of slip over time as, as, as people realize they can sort of get away with more. Um, and so I just want to, you know, at, our, at CDT, our interest is sort of balancing, balancing the innovation and the public interest in using these technologies. And so that's part of the conversation. You, this topic of persistent surveillance has come up, and Don, you mentioned this as well. I mean, this idea of having a, a a flying platform, essentially a flying camera over a large area and watching it all the time. And you mentioned potentially even reading license plates. What does the law say or what do we think it says about the ability of uh, either a governmental agency or even just an individual to watch someone with a camera like this? I mean, uh, the Supreme Court is, has said if you're going to put a GPS tracker on a car, you need a warrant to do that. But do I have an expectation of privacy if I'm just walking down the street? Uh, there are security cameras, probably 15 between here and the next block. But what does the law say about that? Sure. So um, I'm not a lawyer, although I may play a good one occasionally. I'm sort of half a lawyer, half a computer scientist. Um, but um, it, it's clear that you know when the government is operating a surveillance platform and doing so um, in places where people might expect privacy, might have a, what we call a reasonable expectation of privacy, um, you need a warrant you know, premised on probable cause to, to, to collect that information. And you have to do things like minimization. You have to make sure you only collect um, data that's relevant to the investigation. Um, for, for private use, it's much, it's, it's much more broad. Um, there are some things that are clearly no-nos, like voyeurism, you know, using it's, you know, a little tiny drone to view in someone's bedroom is going to get you in, in, in a lot of trouble. Um, I think <laughs> weaponizing drones, I don't, I don't understand the fascination with that because it's just, it's kind of, maybe it's just that's the extreme or whatever, but clearly um, shooting drones or having drones shoot things is probably, you know, it's good, that, that's a totally different thing entirely. But there's sort of like these voyeurism aspects, peeping Tom aspects, video surveillance, you know, these things that, you know, have been, that, that, that over the years policy and law has said, okay, you can photograph pretty much anything in public, but when you get up to that point where uh, people have a, an expectation of privacy, that's when we're going to feel the need to come in and, and stop you. So expectation of privacy in my home, Dom, maybe you want to speak to this, but that's not necessarily walking down the street. Right, exactly. I mean, you have no expectation of privacy for your tag number. That's why you have license plate readers. Where the problem comes in to what do you do with the data that you capture, who has access to it, and how long do you keep it? And it's the same thing with UASs. What are you doing with the data, the images? How long are you keeping it? And what are audit controls and controls that you have in place to make sure it's properly viewed? And then it's taken out of the system and it's purged out. There, that becomes the problem. Uh, let's face it, most of us in here, we've advocated a lot of our privacy away. We, we have with our phones, they track everywhere you go. It's horrible. It really is. It's, it's absolutely horrible. And you're shaking your head. Yeah, eating, totally and completely it's, disagree. It's, what's that? I totally disagree. Okay, but you have, in a way, I mean, Apple can tell you where you are with your iPhone at any time. We have to get that. We have to get a court order to get that if we need that. And that should be the same thing. If it's an expectation of privacy, we should have a, need a search warrant or a court order to access that. And that's how we do it. And we don't, no bones about it. Our, the IACP, the International Association of Chiefs of Police Guidelines, we say that. No, no case law, no what it says. And if you have if this, the curtilage of a house or there's an expectation of privacy, you have to get a search and seizure warrant for it. That's why there's no carte blanche for using these on a crime scene. There's crime scenes in the back of a yard. Mm -hmm. That's the curtilage of a house. You need a search and seizure warrant to process that. And you would have to do the same thing to take the photos from there. You have to, have to include that in there. So we, we look at it like that. I'm, Matt, probably, I'm, probably the, yeah. I'm probably the furthest from being a lawyer on, on sure. the panel here. Um, I would say I'm not a lawyer, but I follow a lot of them on Twitter. Um, <laughs> There was a, there's an interesting argument um, actually in that drone, uh, Jones GPS case about, uh, it was in one of the assenting opinions about how um, 
that kind of persistent surveillance of the government knowing uh, where you